Welcome. I'm happy to see everybody here. Thank you so much for coming and um, for sharing this important conversation about transportation in Santa Barbara and how we can build a more sustainable and usable system for ourselves. Um, our goal here is to help convene important conversations on topics with global impact and local importance, and transportation is certainly one of those issues. And these Global Citizens Club events are designed to foster sort of a constructive dialogue, which is why we have these interesting panelists, and we welcome everybody to ask questions uh, as the, in the later half of the program. It's an opportunity for Santa Barbara citizens to mingle with thoughtful businesses, solutions-oriented fellows, and each other to help us all co-create a more sustainable, healthier, better world for ourselves and a harmonious community. Um, I'd like to recognize Eric uh, Friedman of City Council, who's here tonight. And um, yes, and um, we have a representative from Monique Limon's office, Michelle Sevilla, is here. Welcome. And of course, Greg Hart, our second district supervisor, who is um, has been very involved with this, the local uh, Santa Barbara you know, SB CAG and um, transportation issues here for a long time. And we're thrilled that he's uh, gracing us with his presence. Thank you so much. Um, I'd also like to recognize our primary partner in these Global Citizens Club events, and that's the El Encanto Hotel. They provide us this facility, they, the delicious appetizers, and this fantastic ambiance. So we invite everybody to stay for dinner. And think about this as a place to come during the week for lunch, breakfast, appetizers, drinks. 20%. And you get a, if you're a Global Citizen Club member, you do get a, a card, which you can get some discounts at the restaurants and the spa services and rooms on the uh, Monday through Thursday. So if you want to know about that, please come talk to me. It's for people who are donors to our philanthropic causes. So we'd love to help you get that card. Um, you know, I love to come out here after work and get a glass of wine up on the terrace there. I pretend like I'm on vacation, because it's beautiful. Yeah, so <laughs> anyway, I'd also like to acknowledge our co-hosts tonight, which include uh, Aeropod, Aerohance Gas Pods, Suzanne Chess and um, uh, Bob Evans. And um, they came tonight, and we're having a drawing to win some gas pods, which are amazing little devices uh, that can help you save gas. And Suzanne, you want to explain this real quick? This is a spoiler on a Prius. What they do is you just pop them on the car. <coughs> Excuse me. First of all, we're a local company. They're made in California. Okay, and it is our company. And you, you put them on the car, it changes the aerodynamics so there's less drag on the car. If you have less drag on the car for many cars, almost most cars, you'll burn less fuel. If all of us contribute just a little bit, even just 2% of us, contribute by reducing fuel consumption by 5%, it will be more than any government or industry program in existence in the world today. And we want to support the World Business Academy, so we're, we're going to put these all around town and give a good percentage of sales back. And to if you go to gaspods.com and you buy it and you put in coupon code WBA, you get a discount, and they're only $40 a kit. You get a 10% discount and a donation to the Academy, which is wonderful. Yes. So thank you so much to uh, Arrowhands. <clears throat> yes, it's great. And, and if you put your, your business card or your name in the, in the bowl, which is out there, or you can give it to me later, then you have a chance to win a set of them for your car. Uh, I'd also like to recognize Easy Lift and Coast, the Coalition for Sustainable Transportation here in Santa Barbara, and our speakers, uh, Ernesto Paredes and um, Mark Bradley, are here as panelists, and they'll tell you a bit more about the organizations. So uh, whether it's ensuring our kids have a safe way to bike to school, walk to school, encouraging more sustainable transportation locally with, from Coast, or giving rides to the elderly or infirm who cannot drive any longer to get where they need to go, so to help people move around the city in a way that makes sense. Um, we're very happy to have them here tonight as well. Thank you, Ernesto and Mark. 
And now let me introduce Ronaldo Brudico, who is our moderator for the evening. And he's the founding president of the Academy, an incredible philanthropist, as well as an entrepreneur, and one of the leaders pushing business to do the right thing, take responsibility for the people and the planet that their work touches. So, Ronaldo, thank you so much. He's, he's also the host of Solutions News, which is a radio show on Friday evenings. Show me and How many people know about Solutions News? Oh, great. OK. Yeah. We got this, is our, this is our audience here. So. This is our audience. Okay. <laughs> right. Thank you so much. Like everything, like everything we do, it's free. I, there's something wrong with this economic model. But otherwise, I love doing it. <laughs> um, and by the way, speaking of free, for the first time ever, we've printed proper envelopes. If you want to make a contribution to help support these meetings, we've been, we've been paying for them for about two and a half years. And we'd be delighted if anybody wanted to contribute. But it is not required. And I say that because I think the quality of conversation in this town is worth supporting on its own. So not required. But if you want to help support it, we really welcome anybody who would like to do a contribution to our 501c3. OK, um, I also want to call attention. Is that blog? Or, yes. So there's a great blog article in your packet tonight, which you want to take home and read. Don't try and read it now. But um, Christy, who you just saw, and Bob, have been doing something to test this whole concept of tra mass transit. And the way we've been testing it is they've said, we're going to swear off our cars for one day a week and see if we can get from where we have to go to where we want to go without calling Ernesto, <laughs> which would be one way to do it. At my age, I could pull that off. Uh, the other way is to use a combination of local transit and um, some walking and, in some cases, bicycling. The reason I share that with you is because they're actually doing it. And this is their blog about their experience of two office workers who decided to try this one day a week contribution to reducing our CO2 and our, our greenhouse gases. And I urge you to read it. It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's quite good. It reads well, and you'll enjoy it. And if anybody wants to consider that, we would more than happily invite you to the club of uh, people who are taking one day a week to try and abandon their car. Um, I, I had the good fortune. And, and if you do, please send us that story, and we'll put it in another Publishing. newsletter, and we'll maybe talk about it on Solutions News also. So, oh, yeah. yeah. No, for sure. And by the way, I want to do a, I want to do a shout out to um, uh, the, the, the gas pods, because Ernesto uses them on his easy lift vehicles, and they actually are saying, what, 10, 15 percent fuel economy? Ten percent fuel economy. So this is this is for real. This is not like a tinker toy. This is not like some idea we came up with in the '60s in a hot tub. Although those were good ideas. <laughs> for those of you who are too young to know about '60s in the hot tubs, read about it. <laughs> okay. So with that, let me turn to the evening's um, real entertainment, which isn't me, and to talk about uh, just to set up here what we're doing tonight. We uh, we went through a thing here in our community. Uh, about two years ago, three years ago now, where we started talking about transportation but got very divisive. There was one segment of the community who said, why do want to want to be done with the darn thing? Because we have 37,500 people who are stuck on 101 commuting to and from Santa Barbara every day. That's a big number, and that's a lot of time to stay stuck in traffic. Which, by the way, is the reason we do the show from 5 to 6. That's drive time. So when you are stuck, you've got nothing else to do. Turn us on at 12.90 a.m. The point of this story, though, is the conversation on transportation didn't get to that more fundamental level. It, it stayed like as an either-or conversation, like either trains, more trains, or more 101 widening. And we looked at it as a think tank, and we started analyzing some of the data. For example, we discovered that we have a pretty good circulation element in our bus system here more than I thought we would find. And so as we put all those things together, we concluded that if we had a better conversation about transportation at a deeper level of the question, so however you got to Santa Barbara, if you got stranded on 101 and you crawled your way here, or you came in your car, or however you got here, how do we get around this town? Particularly if we want to be a city of the future, not a city of the 20th century rather than 21st. So that was the genesis of this evening. Uh, you're going to hear from our speakers, and, and I'll be introducing them one at a time. And what I'd like to ask you to do is you, th is you hear this conversation tonight, think through the implications of two things. One, what could we do to quickly change the current dynamic, which is completely automobile driven, to something that would be 
even a little bit more flexible and less producing of GHG, uh, greenhouse gases. Second question is, is there anything you personally would like to do on that topic? Whether it's continue this conversation, give up your car for a day a week, or maybe even get more involved in a longer conversation on how we actually move the needle on this. So that's the purpose of tonight's conversation. And with that, let me introduce our very first speaker who's coming in by Zoom. Um, Christy, um, uh, should I, I mean, the, you've got a bio here on Robin O'Hara. I don't, I don't know if you want me to read it. I don't think it's, it serves any purpose. But Robin is the, I love her title, the head customer experience representative for the TAP Smart Card Program. Now, what TAP is doing in Los Angeles, and you think of how sprawling LA is. It's an enormously challenging transportation question. And what she's doing, and her group at TAP is doing, is they are coming up with ways to create maximum efficiency and economic desirability of intermodal transportation. Now, translated, that means once you buy the ticket, you can ride any way you want. And that kind of thinking may have something to do with what we end up with here. Don't know, but we thought LA is doing it. It's a huge market. It's right next door. Let's hear from somebody who knows how to create intermodal transportation connectivity as a starting point for our conversation tonight. I don't know, is Robin ready to? She's, I think she's ready. Yeah. Great, please. Robin, um, if you like, we can read your bio, but they've got it hand in front of them, including a great picture of you. So I think we just ought to let you take off and tell us what you think, Robin. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, so my name is Robin O'Hara, and uh, I'm an executive officer at Metro in the regional TAP Transit Smart Card Program. Uh, thanks a lot for inviting me to participate tonight. And I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person, but uh, I'm here in spirit and in PowerPoint. So hopefully, uh, hopefully you'll be able to glean a few things from what we're doing. And we're happy to share any of our information with our, our sister cities, especially in California. So today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about how TAP is building an innovative hybrid system that in integrates um, kind of a, a word that's been coined lately called mobility as a service or, or MOS. And it delivers an infinite variety of new options for our customers. So first, a little bit about TAP. We're a contactless chip-based smart card system. Um, we are, operate across all of LA County. Now, this is a pretty giant county. And in, in fact, LA County is larger than 42 US states in population. So it's, it's a pretty massive system. Um, we have uh, 26 TAP agencies, uh, and that includes about 3,800 regional buses, 124 rail stations, and we're growing exponentially because um, we, we have a tax measure that has allowed us uh, to build pretty much in perpetuity. Um, we have a, an award-winning paratransit program. Um, you can see we're, we're pretty big. We do a lot of transactions, 29 million regional transactions a month. We have 750 different fare products on our fare table. Uh, we just, we have a huge volume. Um, and uh, all, of, all of this on our TAP um, transit system. So right now, what we're building is this account-based system. Now, everybody talks about these account-based systems, um, New York, Chicago, San Francisco, um, Portland, a ton of Boston. They're all spending literally half a billion in, uh, dollars and up to build these new systems that, um, that are, are all account-based that are kept in the cloud. And um, what, what we wanted to do is build onto our existing transit system and not have to spend billions of dollars. And so um, we, didn't, we, we didn't want to have to do what everyone else is do, doing and start from scratch when we have a, an actual system that's, that's working pretty well for us. So our TAP card system um, is going to stay the way it is, but what we, what we built on top of that is a, is a layer in Salesforce. Now, this is a one-stop shop for payment and program signup. Uh, so, so what we built um, means that we can connect with any number of programs such as bike share or the microtransits of the world, our, our fare subsidy programs, parking, um, electric vehicle car sharing, um, ride hailing like Lyft and Uber. We have the ability to connect 
to any of those uh, account-based services now um, through this layer that we built on top of our existing legacy tap card system. So um, what, what's great about this is that um, we don't necessarily have to start from scratch. We, we um, leverage our existing system to continue to um, grow and expand. So what we did just about six months ago is we launched um, very quietly uh, with our first um, bike share account. Um, we launched at the National Association of City Transit Officials. So if any of you guys were there for that uh, conference, we launched our, our first um, program there. So um, you can now pay for bike share with your TAP account. And we are um, literally talking to uh, about 20 other programs to, to um, be able to connect. So we are very excited about um, the future of, of what, we, what we've built. So let me tell you a little bit about how we build it, built it. So we, we have a Cubic Built, um, that's the company of the, um, the, that built our existing legacy transit system. Um, it, it's a, play, it's a, a system where you tap your tap card and you enter through gates or you, you tap it on the fare box and enter buses. And um, as I said, we built um, a, a layer on top of this system that we call Tap Force. It's built in Salesforce. And that layer allows us um, through software connections that we call APIs to talk, talk to our transit system. It allows us to use a tap wallet um, to virtually then connect with the likes of bike share. Um, again, we can connect with any account-based system. We can do toll lanes. We can do electric vehicle car sharing. We can do fare subsidy programs. We can do parking and really any, any amount of other, other types of uh, ticketing. So um, in 2028, LA will have the Olympics. And so we plan on having uh, ticketing available through our tap card for those, uh, those events as well. So it's a, a pretty cool layer that is extremely powerful and versatile. And then um, as we move along, we will be able to tie it all together with our new app that will come out this fall. And the, the app just makes it all the more seamless because you will be able to tap with your phone just like they're gonna be able to do that, like they do right now in Portland. We'll have that same capability to be able to tap with our phones and in that same app, purchase bike shares, toll lanes, electric vehicle car sharing, and much more. Another one of the benefits that we have is uh, cash loading. Um, one of the things that mobil mobility as a service um, uh, kind of stresses um, is, is the ability to offer equity. Um, that means that we have a lot of customers that ride our transit system that don't necessarily have bank accounts, but that still want to be able to use um, the TAP uh, wallet. In the past, uh, how, do you, how do you add money to a, how do you add cash to a, an account um, if you don't have, um, if, it's, if it's in the cloud? Um, now we, through, through what we built, we have cash loading available to our unbanked. Um, and we have done that through a, um, a company called Pay Near Me. So what, uh, what we did is we added a bunch of different um, new payment choices. Um, we, uh, we still have our debit and credit um, uh, payment available, but the Pay Near Me access is great because you can download a barcode, take it into a CVS or a 7-Eleven, pay the cashier and that immediately goes into your tap wallet and you can use it for to push funds to your transit card or you can um, pay for any of the account-based services that will be attached. PayPal has also been a super great choice and, and very popular with our customers. So just adding those account loading choices is super important. Um, one of the other things that we built in the system is a rewards system that will let the customer choose. So um, we base it on the Starbucks model. Um, so if you go to Starbucks, if you're a Starbucks lo lover like I am, you may go into Starbucks when you have uh, enough rewards and you are not forced to, um, you're not forced into a black coffee. They don't just say, hey, here's your reward, it's a black coffee. Rather, you can choose from the menu. 
And so what we want to do is offer rewards across programs so that the customer can collect rewards and maybe try a new mode, maybe try bike share, um, maybe try an electric vehicle, or maybe try um, a, a scooter sharing or other types of uh, account-based services. One of the big um, things that, that um, this system can do for us is um, have the ability to in incentivize our customer behavior. And um, it allows us to quickly be able to configure discounts that can incentivize our customers to do whatever we would um, like to push them into. So for example, if we have a breakdown um, on one of our trains, we can quickly offer discounts on bike share or, or on, um, on uh, transit passes. Um, we can respond to uh, quickly to events, um, either entertainment events, sports events, by offering discounts that are really configurable in about um, 15 or, or 20 minutes and then easily uh, removable as well. So the, the system allows us to be super nimble, which is great. One of the other benefits that we have is um, the ability to share discounts across programs. So for example, if you're a student or a senior, you're automatically eligible for programs that have enabled those discounts. And this really amounts to uh, almost personalized price, pricing for um, our products, depending upon your program registration level. So no longer do you have to have multiple signups for every program's discounts because we have these these discount groups set up, programs can take advantage of the already set up options or, or uh, develop their own. And these discounts can be shared across programs. And that's one of the reasons that we have gotten so many um, um, requests to join TAP so far, so far uh, because of this ability to um, have these discounts already set up that they can choose to um, offer uh, lower trayers for their for their own program, and then they just participate in the discount group that's already set up. So that basically finishes my um, uh, that's that's the super fast tap 101, and I'm happy to I I'm, I think you're trying to push the questions to the end, but I'm not sure I can stay. So um, I'm not sure if you want me to answer a couple questions now, or if you would like me to. Um, it, I, I'm also happy to respond to questions by email or, or text, so happy to provide that information. Thank you so much, Robin, and you can all see why um, she is a summa cum laude graduate of the University of Pittsburgh and was valedictorian of her master's class at the Mineta Institute of Transportation. That's named after Norm Mineta, by the way, who man I got to know <laughs> when I was a younger individual. And um, her credentials speak legions about her commitment to the customer experience. Remember, her title is Head of Customer Experience for the TAP program. And what we're hoping that you'll get from this is that we can create customer experience in Santa Barbara as well. Uh, we certainly can. Robin, thank you so much. And we will forward any questions that come to us by email. We will forward them to you. And uh, she will be more than delighted to answer any questions. Thank you, Robin. Thank you very much. Our next panelist is Mark Bradley from Coast. He's the president of Coast. Um, I, I enjoy the fact that he spent 12 years in the UK and Netherlands and just over 20 years in California, so I figure that's sort of balanced. I, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it, would, it would say he's a little wiggy. <laughs> anyway, what, what Mark does is he, he models stuff, and you know what modeling is, and I'm not talking about air paper airplanes now. We're talking about looking at data sets and trying to model for long-range planning and to decide or to help us decide how we can optimize our local last mile. So this conversation today is a lot about the last mile. The TAP program is the last mile in LA. How do we integrate all those last mile choices? And as you just heard, LA has many more last mile charges than, options than we do. For example, we have no bike share. Interesting, why we don't, something we ought to be thinking about, electric or manual bikes. Um, we've also eliminated scooters at this point, whether that's a good idea or not, I don't know, and I'm not taking a position on it. But we clearly have far fewer last mile choices. So what Mark is here to do to, for us tonight is to help us understand some of the modeling that he does and how that could apply perhaps to Santa Barbara. You gonna speak from there, Mark, or are you gonna come up here? So please give a warm uh, round of applause for Mark Bradley, President of Coast.
Okay, thank you. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak <clears throat> on behalf of Coast. Uh, as you can see, we're a nonprofit. We uh, we uh, promote environmentally environmentally friendly ways of traveling, and I'll talk more about some of those things. Uh, I've I've worked for Coast for about 15 years, or I've been the, on the board for about 15 years. But the, my paid job that allows me to stay here in Santa Barbara is uh, as a consultant, as was mentioned. I'm not going to bore you with modeling talk. I'll talk more about what uh, Coast does. But one of my, or actually my biggest consulting project right now is in the city of Copenhagen. So I thought I would just give a little comparison of how people get to work in Copenhagen versus Santa Barbara. So about half the people walk and bike, which are the, the most environmentally energy efficient ways of traveling. Uh, and, and about a quarter use transit, a quarter drive. And uh, Santa Barbara, people who live in Santa Barbara, you know, the numbers are a lot smaller, but actually 5% transit is pretty good for in the US for a city of Santa Barbara's size. And 5% bike share is also really good. In fact, Santa Barbara was just named the, the number one bike city of California. I think more for a lot of the plans and things that are happening rather than what's happening right now. But, uh, but even with all that, you see we, we still have a long way to go to get to something like uh, Copenhagen. Uh, you know, and Copenhagen may be an ex a great example, but there, there are dozens of cities in Northern Europe that are more like Copenhagen than they are like, uh, like Santa Barbara. So, so we do have a ways to go. Uh, so the question is, why are they different? Uh, Danish people aren't born hating cars, so a lot of, they would, they would like to drive but there are a few reasons why they don't. Uh, one is land use. Uh, they have kind of a head start because their cities were built hundreds of years before cars were around. So um, it's not always easy to get around in them in a car. But they really have active policies to promote uh, mixed use development, transit oriented development, protect open space. So. Uh, it's not just how they started, but it's, it's, it's an ongoing process. Also, pricing. To buy a car in Denmark is really expensive. I mean, the, the tax is just about double the price of the car. And then the uh, fuel, high fuel taxes, too. So that's a decision. Um, an environmental economist might say they're paying the actual cost of the car, if you take into account ex, you know, environmental costs and things. And even some uh, libertarian economists in this country now are thinking we should have a user pay-as-you-go system for the roads. So I think it's going to come pretty soon, maybe not as extreme as Denmark, but uh, I think maybe in the form of carbon, carbon pricing or something, we'll see road pricing. But I'm not going to talk any more about that. Uh, the third one is infrastructure. Um, so they use the money from all those taxes to build a lot of a great system of bike lanes, great transit system, uh, ways to walk, get around. So oh, I should say, um, so the reason why we really need to accelerate these things in the US, as you might know, is, is climate change, I would say. Uh, every Wednesday, or the last Wednesday of every month, Coast has what we call Walking Wednesdays, where we take people around a part of the city. Uh, you can't go to this month because it's happening right now at this moment. But uh, last month we were, Dave Davis, who some of you might know, took us at the waterfront to show us some scenarios of sea level rise in Santa Barbara and what the plans are. And it really wasn't a pretty picture what he was talking about. So I do have a pretty picture. Uh, this is uh, the 16th Street Mall in Denver, but it's also a picture of what State Street could look like in Santa Barbara. And uh, 
Really what we need to do is rezone State Street, one thing, so we can get apartments where there's unused commercial space now. Uh, we need to create some car-free zones. We could still have the waterfront shuttle running up and down uh, to get people around. Uh, an even prettier picture is that same place at night. So, it's nice there. So, coming back to infrastructure. So, the number one reason why more people don't bike and walk in Santa Barbara is because they think it's dangerous. And the reason they think it is because it is dangerous. Uh, there, in the last 10 years, there have been twice as many cyclists and pedestrians killed in Santa Barbara compared to motorists. Uh, if, if you put that in terms of per trip or per mile, it would, the numbers would just be off the charts because there's so many more car trips out there. So, um, so it is dangerous. Uh, so Coast has advocated for, a, it's really a worldwide movement called Vision Zero. And the idea is that traffic fatalities aren't inevitable. They can be prevented and the goal is zero fatalities. And uh, so it comes partly through enforcement. Uh, a problem for enforcement is that the police don't have a lot of resources to do enforcement. So we're advocating for more resources. Um, but a lot of it is we need just better infrastructure. So um, one, one project we have is East Side Walks, which is sort of a grassroots program to get the residents on the east side where there is a lot of walking and biking to advocate for infrastructure improvements. And they just opened up a new, round, a new bridge at the roundabout at Montecito Street down at the bottom of APS here. Uh, that has bike lanes and nice sidewalks and things. Used to be pretty bad. So that just happened. Um, you know, east side walks really only happened after a, a child was run over on Milpa Street. And it's, it, it's been the case a lot of times when things only, projects only happen after somebody dies. But the whole, the whole vision behind Vision Zero is preventative. Uh, to prevent accidents before they happen. And I think cities like Santa Barbara, Goleta are really starting to take over that, that kind of uh, approach. So I'll just wrap up a little bit here. The, the, those things don't happen overnight. It take, people develop their travel habits when they're pretty young. And so it takes, can take generations or a generation or two to uh, change how people travel. I've analyzed a lot of data in the US and found that every generation walks and bikes a little bit more than the previous generation did at the same age. But it's going pretty slow, so we really need to accelerate that. And one, our coast's biggest project is Safe Routes to School. So in all the elementary schools in the, uh, and this happens all over the country, but we do, we do all the elementary schools in the on the south coast, uh, teaching kids both pedestrian safety, bicycle safety, and um, we're even getting into, into the P phys ed classes in a lot of schools where they give the kid bi kids who don't have bikes, they will give them bikes to use. Uh, the idea is, we hope, that if kids and we also educate the parents, too, because a lot of times it's the parents who won't let their kids walk or bike. So the idea is that, uh, you know, they'll develop habits. And, and I should mention that SB Bike, the Bike Coalition, continues to set kind of education in the junior highs and high schools as, as much as they can. So hopefully by the time they graduate and get out of school, They'll be open to using things like bike share, e-scooter share, some of these new modes, maybe even uh, using those modes and using Uber and Lyft instead of owning a car. Uh, so that's possible. Uh, what everybody asks me these days is, what's going to happen with autonomous vehicles? So that's taking over all the, uh, all the research. One thing that's pretty sure is when they do come someday, they'll make our roads a lot safer 
not just for the drivers, but they'll be less likely to run over bicyclists and pedestrians, which will be nice if, if they work properly, which I guess is the assumption. Uh, uh, but there's a big question, will they really help in terms of our environment? If they're just private autonomous vehicles, they probably won't. In fact, people will probably drive them further than they drive their cars now. But if, if they're pooled and integrated with transit, as uh, was just mentioned, uh, then I think they really could be a benefit. So, and my last thing with those, those question marks is just that 10 years ago, nobody knew, nobody was planning on scooter share or Uber or Lyft. They weren't even on the horizon. So 10 years from now, there may be a totally different things that happen that we aren't even thinking about today. So, thank you. For those of you who have never been to Cortona, Italy, I urge you to go. It's the only city that is, pays for an outdoor escalator that takes all of its residents up the hill. Because what they found was, like Santa Barbara, they had a graying population. And the population couldn't get from the bottom of the hill to the top of the hill easily. So they literally maintain, at city expense, an outdoor escalator. And it's fun to ride. <laughs> so if you go, and by the way, Cortona is famous because it was the city featured in the book Under the Tuscan Sun. It's a classic city. Um, I also want to share with you real quickly about, because um, Mark mentioned it, so I'm just going to touch on it quickly. Um, you mentioned climate change. And uh, on Monday of next week at the latest, we will be publishing a major white paper on climate change, which uh, is, I think as far as I know, the most advanced research on the planet right now on the implications of the methane complication of the CO2 emissions. And what it does is it, it, it paints a very bleak picture, very bleak picture, about where we're going in terms of climate change. Uh, normally, we, we don't cover that on Solutions News because the solution isn't that we're burning up. The solution is what we'll do about it. But if, for those of you who are interested in the climate change issue, we will be doing a major paper on that, and it'll come out about Monday. So uh, watch for it. It'll be in the emails that we send out. And if you aren't on our email list yet, please feel free to get on it quickly. OK, the next speaker for us tonight is <clears throat> Ernesto. And um, to me, when you're talking the last mile, nobody has a tougher job in this town than Ernesto. He has no roots and he has no schedules. He's in what's called a demand service. So for the elderly and for the infirm, for 27, 28 years now, is that, yeah, Lyft has been doing this incredibly difficult task of getting people who have a really hard time around town who need to get around town. They need to do it safely and they need to do it on a really uh, efficient method. And Ernesto is really, uh, to his credit, has been able to push through all the blocks that would otherwise make that seem like an impossible concept. And what I asked him to do tonight is, if he has any observations about what we could do about the, the last mile here in Santa Barbara, nobody's had a tougher contest with how to deal with that than Ernesto. And maybe he can shine some light from his experience on how we could achieve that. You'll read his bio here, but basically he's been the executive director of Lyft for 28 years and is one of the most knowledgeable people in our community about transportation. Ernesto? Well, thank you, Ronaldo. I appreciate the, uh, the invitation, absolutely. Anytime I have an opportunity to share about Easy Lyft transportation, that's Easy Lyft, not just Lyft. That's wrong Lyft. Um, but you know, the organization is celebrating its 40th year here in Santa Barbara, and I've been with the organization for just over 25 years. So I've seen a huge shift. When I came on board back in 1991, Greg Hart was just leaving there, and he had a great head of hair back then. You would know it. <laughs> dashing young man. Uh, still is, still dashing, just no hair. Um, <laughs> No, but it was great. It's, it's been great for me to be able to work with Greg and others. And when I came on board, it was just after the passage of the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act. And so as a young executive, I got to see and be part of 
the development of how transportation was going to look for people with uh, severe disabilities and uh, frail seniors. Now, I always like to look at a crowd like this and think, okay, how many people here in the last 12 months have used MTD? It's good. It's pretty good. How many people have used the, the Santa Barbara Airbus? Actually, there's more people who've used the Airbus. I'm always fascinated because, I mean, Eric, Eric Onan is here, and again, just another transportation pioneer who has been extremely successful that at some point we've all uh, been able to use the benefit of uh, the Airbus. So we're very fortunate. A lot of people don't realize, actually, with MTD, how great a system we actually have in Santa Barbara. It's a fantastic system. We don't take advantage of it because you saw the numbers. We want to be in our cars. And I can't tell you how many mid-county mid meetings I attend with other transit leaders, and guess what? We all show up in our own cars. Yeah, yeah. We don't necessarily follow the things that we are trying to say. Now, what I'm supposed to be doing is really looking out for the individuals that could not easily get here as easily as you did tonight. People who are using a wheelchair or some type of walking device or mobility device. And hopefully, maybe some of us will get to that point if we're lucky. And statistically, we'll have more 100-year-olds in this room in the next you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 years. So what I'm trying to do is make sure that you have the equal access. So you have not only for great events like this, but a, a majority of our 3,000, actually about 3,500 current passengers, most of them are accessing, what do you think? What's the biggest thing that you would think that they would access? Healthcare going to appointments, and, you know, and the second one really is some type of nutrition, either nutrition program or going to Trader Joe's or something that has to do with uh, fuel. If you don't take care of yourself medically, if you don't take care of yourself nutrition-wise, that's when the spiral really begins. That is the thing, that's what keeps me up at night because every day we always have a, um, a waiting list, meaning someone couldn't get a ride for that next day. So with our service, you can get a ride, you can call up to two weeks in advance, up to the next day, from the next day up to two weeks in advance. Over the years, I've just seen it increase every year, at least 10 to 15% every single year, statistically. Which means we have to, as a, as a nonprofit, I want to have just enough service out there so I'm not wasting a vehicle just sitting there on the sides, but each very efficiently being able to provide transportation uh, and again, not just transportation, specialized transportation, meaning we're looking out for your mom. We're looking out for your dad. That's how personally we take it. That's how personally I took it. My parents, my, you know, my dad who passed away three years ago, and my mom who currently uses the system are users. I've become much more, a, a, actually a better executive director because of my experience with my parents of seeing the craziness of accessing healthcare the craziness of just going and getting a prescription. They don't want to do anything until they pick up the prescription. Don't talk to me about events, don't talk to me about going to the Riviera Theater, nothing, until I get my prescriptions. And some of you have been able to go to CVS or to your, to your pharmacy of choice. It could take five minutes, it could take 105 minutes to pick up your prescription. And they'll tell you, we got one ready for you, but the next one's not ready, come back tomorrow. Well, when you're on a fixed income, well, like a lot of our passengers are, and you have to try to schedule a ride and get to get to your pick up your prescription. So it's, we, we charge $3.50 to go anywhere in South Santa Barbara County. Now that sounds like an absolute deal, which in theory it is, but if you're on a fixed income and you have to go dialysis three days a week and go grocery shopping, that adds up really quickly. So for us, we're really getting to, looking to the point where I want to shrink as an organization, not necessarily grow. I really am pulling my, you know, crossing my fingers. We talk about drone service. For me, drone service would be, is going to be unbelievable because so many of our passengers are going to prescriptions and there's gonna be a way where, come on, if you could deliver a pizza or deliver, that will save having to go another vehicle on the road to pick up prescriptions. Those are simple things that will happen because the way I provide transportation is very expensive. It's one or two people at a time. And that just can't be sustained with all of us getting older and older and wanting to access the community. Where when we started as an organization, people who used a wheelchair or had a severe disability, where were they? You didn't see them. They're in the back room. Maybe going to a hospital and then coming back. And that's it. You never saw them in the community. We have such a warm, welcoming community. 
you go to a grocery store and someone might be begging, you know, someone with a disability is begging your groceries or greeting you or part of our, 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 the fabric of our commission. I love that. So it's my job to continue doing that. So as a nonprofit, it's always trying to figure out where is that soft spot. Years ago, we were part of the, the campaign for Measure D, the uh, sales tax, the fuel sales tax. It was beckoned, uh, it was a 20 year sales tax. And so after 20 years, I remember when I first came on board, I thought, oh, this is great. We don't have to worry, the I just came on board, we don't have to worry about this tax for 20 years. I'll be long gone by then. And then there's, there was a campaign for uh, the next one, which is continuation of that tax, which has turned into Measure A. But it was interesting, because the locals who were here, the, the, the people who were putting together Measure A, as you know, we have a community that is transitionary. They come in, they work for a few years, and then they move out and they go to different better jobs, bigger jobs, some other communities. But I was here. And when they were putting together Measure A, easy transportation or funding for transportation, a specialized transportation, was nowhere on the plan. It was embarrassing. We were such a big part of the Measure D of being able to provide this specialized transportation in this community. And then the, the local government, not current government, the local government at the time chose not to include us. And so, again, we had to have our, we had to rally our troops, so to speak, and that's a, a people who are really advocating for people who with a severe disability. And that is becoming further and for, uh, far in between in regards to having true advocates in our community, because we're all nice people. We all like each other. There's, we're, we are not made up of enough advocates, especially people who really can't speak for themselves. And so the people who I grew up with, who are my mentors, have either retired or they've passed away. And there were some classic individuals that you always saw at the city council meetings, at the board of soups, always making sure that their, their needs for their constituents were being heard. And it worked. It's not happening anymore. So you have things like Uber and Lyft, which is fantastic. It's changed all of our lives, but not a person who uses a wheelchair. It's the same. Once again, they don't care, they don't, they don't care about us because there's not anything to be done. Lyft and Uber would rather pay the penalty of not abiding by the, AB, uh, the ADA than actually figuring this out. That's gonna have to change, and it will. Will be pressure. But there's things that frustrate me, like just recently there was the, this uh, person who was locked up in, with, a, with a gun around San Marcos High School. You read about all of this. And when, if you were in that area, it shut everything down. And that's when you realize, oh my goodness, we really are in this, this little island. And the idea, and I understand for you know, the, the, the decision that was made to shut everything down on the freeway, even though it was up towards Turnpike, for, every, the, for the public safety, what doesn't ever get discussed is the public safety of people who could not get to dialysis that day. You know how sick they were? The people who were trying to get to medical appointments who could not get there that day. And as you know, as, even if it's, you planned a dermatology appointment, you know how long it takes to make a dermatology appointment in this town? Three months, six months, name it. And for a lot of these people, it devastated them. Just that one, those three hours have devastated so many individuals and families. So transportation, being able to access this, and we can go about the mudslides. I'm also on the board of Cottage Health System. So many of our employees, guess what? They don't live here. They live in, in Ventura. They couldn't get here. So we had to get the Condor Express. Some doctors had to come in on Cessnas. And then finally, we were able to work with the CHP and be able to kind of escort us in and out when it was safe. We have a real, again, it's, it is truly paradise. I would never say anything, you could never complain about living in Santa Barbara. And to find out about this organization, I mean, the, the, mind, the minds that you have associated with this organization. I mean, I want to be part of this more and more because you have great people in this room or a lot of people who aren't even in this, in this room. And the solutions are there. It's the priorities. I mean, our infrastructure, I just came back, just a couple more seconds, I just came back from, uh, from Japan. Anyone ever been to Japan and their infrastructure? Unbelievable. It's embarrassing how we claim to be such a great country and our transportation infrastructure, is, it stinks compared to what it can look like. Their infrastructure is fabulous. I mean, you can time it up by the second, whether it's, a, whether it's a taxi cab, whether it's a train, whether it's a, the, uh, the um, bullet train. Unbelievable. Now, on the other side of it, of course, uh, Japan, Germany, they can't have armies. So, guess what? The money doesn't go, they don't have defense spending. Where does our money go? Our number one you know, priority, defense. If we cut that 
10%. Can you imagine the infrastructure we would have in this country? It'd be, we'd have the best bridges, the best roads, the best everything. We, we wouldn't have a lot of the issues that we're talking about right now if we didn't have so much in defense. It's a political issue, of course. And the lastly, I wanted to mention was, well, the other thing when there in Japan, I, when I was there, I never saw a person with a disability. And there, and we, it wasn't, there wasn't ADA accessibility there. So there's things that we kind of will dog ourselves on. And I will say, thank goodness that we, you know, one of the greatest civil rights was the ADA in our lifetime, in my lifetime. You know, and it's not, we're not done with that. It's just a lot of work to be done. I really do appreciate the opportunity to speak to you all. If, if you have any questions about what's going to happen, because it's, the challenges that we have are just going to get greater and greater. So again, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And again, there'll be questions in a minute from all the panelists. You know, it's um, <clears throat> it's interesting what Ernesto is dealing with, and we don't know what the implications of basically demand scheduling are. We haven't thought that through. But do you notice he touched on the idea <clears throat> that we have a good MTA? <clears throat> he touched on the idea there ought to be some differentiation in the way we go about intermodal transportation than the way we've historically done it with a dependence on the car. Same thing came up in, in the conversation with um, Mark Bradley. One of the things that we want to look at in this community in that last mile conversation, I mean, for example, the Santa Barbara Airporter, which we just mentioned, thank you for coming tonight, appreciate it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> now does cruise ship connections Right, And so that's not how they got started, but they adapted to cruise ships, which have started coming to our port. And it seems to me that part of what has to happen here is that we as the citizens of this community have to be urging not only our business community, can you come up with better integrated solutions? Because we do have a decent MTA. We don't have ride share, uh, bike share. We don't have e-bike share, although I'm sure something of that will come soon. And I know there's been controversy over e-scooters, which so that's still on the hold. But this combination of forces, the civic society, the civil society, that's us. The business community looking for ways to make a legitimate profit, providing a service that we need. And the nonprofit community, particularly as represented by Ernesto, who's willing to do the hardest last mile, which is the demand last mile for the infirm, when you put all those together, it serves up an interesting conundrum. How do we get from here, May 20 something in the year 2019, how do we get from here to the future? And for that, we turn to Greg Hart. So, Greg, you've heard what we're looking for. Do you all know Greg Hart? Give me a hand. Come on. A Santa Barbara City Council refugee now sitting on the Board of Supervisors. Give him a hardball. The hardballs will be later, so I'm sure. Um, well, you know, this is a really interesting topic, and, and I have been working with Mark and Ernesto for a really long time, as Ernesto very clearly <laughs> described, um, and they do really incredibly important work. You know, COAST is the advocacy group that is pushing local governments to be more adaptable and be more flexible and, and promote alternative transportation. Ernesto is doing the hard work of looking out for seniors and folks who have... Um, transportation disabilities, and, and these are really important issues. But I think it is, it is important, too, to recognize how far we have come. You know, we are not um, Copenhagen, um, as Mark pointed out, and we have a long way to go in that respect, but we're doing a much better job in 2019 than we were doing 10 and 15 years ago. And that is because citizens are demanding more. Um, but we have tremendous infrastructure here in our community. If you think about Carpinteria, Santa Barbara, and Goleta, you know, those communities were developed um, to a great extent pre-car, less so with Goleta, but certainly Santa Barbara and Carpinteria. So there's a very sophisticated grid um, street network with sidewalks and walkability. If you walk out of this hotel and you try to go down to the east side of Santa Barbara, there are um, walkways that go down the hills that were built, you know, 100 years ago that work really, really well and, and were designed properly. Um, bicycle infrastructure, we were pioneers and leaders 20 years ago. There was a long period of time when we were not making adequate investments in bicycle 
bicycle infrastructure, but that is turning around dramatically in the last couple of years. There are new bike paths that are regional connections that are going in in Carpinteria to connect um, the city of Carpinteria to the, the class one bikeway that runs along the freeway at the Rincon area, connecting all the way to Ventura. These projects are happening now. They've been funded with big investments. The folks at SBCAG, there's a whole bunch of uh, my former uh, colleagues uh, from SBCAG here uh, working daily to make these projects happen in conjunction with the 101 freeway widening. There's new bike paths in the city of Santa Barbara. The Santa Barbara um, City Council a couple of years ago passed a really forward thinking bicycle master plan and the, the city staff has been incredibly aggressive going after state grants to make those things happen. Probably the most effective local government in getting those state grants of anything in the state of California. More dollars are coming into our community through those state active transportation grant programs than any place else in the state of California, which is why the city of Santa Barbara was recognized as the, you know, the leading bicycle friendly community in the state of California just recently, about a week ago or so. So th this stuff is not happening in a vacuum. It's happening because citizens are asking for it. It's, it's happening because, as Mark described, you know, such situations with bicycles and infrastructure isn't adequate to encourage people to do more of that. But we're making these kind of investments. There's new bike path that's going to go in on Las Positas Road, connecting up with MODOC, um, that will provide a, another class one bicycle separated from the street infrastructure. It's going to connect up with the extension of that bike path along MODOC into the county, connecting up to the Auburn Trail out in um, the area of Modoc and Hollister and that intersection. Um, and, and then when you think about it, the Auburn Trail was an investment 20 years ago that con continues all the way out to UCSB. So we have in place a regional bicycle network that's going to be completed in probably the next five years that will be really kind of state of the art, um, connecting Ventura County to Santa Barbara County. Um, we are investing in new train service that's critically important. For years and years, as Ronaldo described, we had a debate between are we going to widen the freeway with a carpool lane or are we going to invest in a um, commuter train system? Well, the answer is we're going to do both, and we need to do both. And we now have new train service that connects Ventura County to South Santa Barbara County. Folks can take the train in in the mornings. They can take the train home in the evenings. That's brand new service. It's only been about a year in existence. Um, it has had struggled with its ridership. It comes in very early in the morning, about 7 o'clock in the morning, into downtown Santa Barbara at 7.15 in Goleta leaves Goleta at 4.30 and, and gets to Santa Barbara at 4.45. So the timing isn't perfect, but it was the, it, it was the only time that was available with a very complicated um, Southern California rail system that connects San Luis Obispo all the way down to San Diego. And, and there are efforts on that regional uh, level to add additional trains so that we can have a, a train at a different time of the day um, a little bit later in the morning to serve more of customers. But there's a real challenge to the local community to the local business community to make that service successful. We need more riders. We need more flexibility from employers to say that folks who are starting a train trip that early in the morning can begin their work day by getting on their laptops, working on the, with, the, with Wi-Fi to um, access their email and get work done and have that be counted as part of their work day to make it to create an incentive for people to do that, to, to make that infrastructure work. Um, so I, I'm really optimistic about the future. You know, the, the challenge is daunting. The, the urgency of climate change is really daunting. We do have to do more. We have to do more faster. But we, we should be proud as a community that our local governments are responsive to these demands, are trying to provide new opportunities. UCSB, they do have bike share. The city of Santa Barbara just recently said we're going to move forward with that as well. There's been a lot of planning going on behind the scenes to make those systems integrated and working. Um, um, Isla Vista has um, scooters that are uh, very successful in that environment. There's a lot of lessons to, to be learned about that. There's some serious um, safety questions about that. UCLA just released a study about um, two or three months ago that, that indicated the incredibly high level of, um, of dangerous accidents that occur from scooters. That technology needs to evolve, needs to be better, needs to be smarter, needs to be safer. The companies that are operating that space need to be more responsible and more attuned to the safety implications of that. But there is there's reason for optimism. There's a lot of things bubbling up in our community. And um, 
the staffs at the local government levels, the community organizations like Coast and others um, are working in that space and innovating and trying to provide new opportunities and new um, transportation options for our community because we, we have to. We cannot re rely on the past and the, and the car-centric community that we have developed. Um, we need to have tighter, denser land use, and that, that is happening as well. So I'm really optimistic about the future. I think we, we have, have learned a lot from the past. Um, we have excellent basic infrastructure in the community with the, the density of the mountains and the ocean and the, the linear corridor that we have from Carpenter to Goleta. So um, I think working together, we can achieve really good things in the future, and I look forward to being part of that. Thank you. For those of you who complained that I gave softball questions to Greg, this is your chance to throw hard balls or softballs, either way. Um, the questions are from the floor now. So would you please, and again, if you have a question for Robin, send us a note, info at worldbusiness.org, and we will get it answered for you by Robin in LA. But for the panelists that are here tonight, uh, I'd love to have some questions from the floor. Anybody? Yeah. Yeah, the, we, we do film these and we tape them for the people who can't come, so please wait till the microphone gets to you. Okay, do we have some questions or comments? Either one. Say your name too, please. Oh, I'm Nancy Douglas. Thank you, Nancy. And um, Ernesto, um, my brother uses Easy Lift and he has been doing that for several years. An outstanding organization. Um, and you, I think, uh, Greg, you answered my question about Ventura. I was concerned about the 30,000 or plus people that travel back and forth from Ventura every day. Uh, and how can we get them to use the train system if that's appropriate, if that would be the easiest place for them to go. And then the other concern is like, we live in the Riviera and um, this would be more for uh, Copenhagen or um, you know, what would be appropriate for us to get people off the hill down to the lower levels by using bikes or something else that's more appropriate uh, because there's no way I'm going to walk down APS and I'm always worried about hitting somebody that's, you know, jogging or riding a bike down APS. So there are things that we can certainly do and it sounds like, Greg, that we are actually doing that, which is wonderful. Um, so I, it's more a comment more than a question because I'm not even sure what the answers are to what I'm stating. But um, Anyway, um, it, it sounds like we're making progress and moving in the right direction, which is wonderful. And, and I'd take your encouraging not only bike share, but other innovative solutions on that last mile. This lady over here in the back, please. Hi. Um, I was just back in uh, Illinois visiting, and for $5, I got a lifetime bus pass. And I don't know if I'm going back there ever again, but I got one anyway because... <laughs> When I was there for four days, I was on and off that thing all the time, and it runs late at night, and um, because I grew up there, I knew where it went, and um, so anyway, I was um, pleasantly surprised at this opportunity, and you just show them that you're a certain age, you show your ID, they take a picture, you get a, you know, um, like a credit card size, and I was thrilled that they had chosen that. And they don't do it every day, 24-7. Certain days, certain times, you go in and you make an, you know, um, arrangements to be there. And it was so worthwhile because I do take the bus occasionally here in Santa Barbara. And I live downtown. I like walking. So I go for days without driving my car. And I used to have two. I'm down to one. And um, I think it's great. We do have very good service here. And it's looking for something um, better as well. And Ernesto has really great service and um, other opportunities there, like the uh, movie at the Riviera once a month, other things. You know, to that point, Ernesto, is there some um, possibility for expansion of what Easy Lift does to incorporate serving the broader public than the infirm or... Yes, absolutely. We've been asked to do that, but also we have great partners in our community that we, you know, who are also doing a good job, a very good job. Um, the, the program she was talking about, once a month, we pick up seniors and take, we, we've had this partnership with the, uh, the film festival. 
So on Tuesdays, when it's not really that busy during the afternoon, it's perfect for our seniors to get a free ride up to the Riviera and enjoy, as you know, world-class movies. And to boot, they get a free Coke and popcorn. It's the best experience. It's so much fun to see these you know, seniors acting like kids again, They'd be able to have fun and enjoying it. Again, if you haven't been to the Riviera Theater, it's unbelievable. They've done a great job. So thank you for mentioning that. And, you know, this, this also raises the question of the, in terms of the last mile. Uh, we have an electric bus system that started out years ago to service the, basically State Street. And because we have really strategically located parking lots in Santa Barbara, there's a lot of conversation, which we were going to conclude tonight, but we just didn't have time, on how we could expand that electric bus system and maybe even do something like what TAP does, where if you pay one fee, 50 cents or a dollar, you can ride all day. So you could come from a, a parking garage, go to your favorite merchant on State Street, buy something, get back on the bus, and go to another merchant, get back on the bus, go back to your car. So we haven't been able to flush that out for tonight's conversation, but if there is a desire in the community to keep talking about this issue, we will start to flush out some of these other things, which are not what Ernesto does precisely, although I think there's some expansion possibilities there. It's also building on what we already have, which is a strong MTA and a strong electric bus issue. So I just want to keep you thinking about all these different alternatives in that last mile. Okay, other questions or comments over here? I have a comment. Name, question. please. Art Ludwig. Ludwig, yeah. And um, I have one for Mark. It's sort of a comment question, and then I have a comment. And my comment question is, when you're in Copenhagen and you see just these swarms of buses and bikes and an occasional car, you think that these must be some kind of other species than us. Um, and I heard that 40 years ago, the mode split for bicycles was one-fifth of what it is in the present day. Is that true? I don't know the exact number, but it was a lot lower. They've really, um, you know, it used to be that the Netherlands was the bike country, you know, and uh, Germany too, but the, the uh, Copenhagen is really, they built this wonderful, um, system of, of bike paths. So there's separated bike paths on just about every street in the city. And uh, so that's really helped. Um, people use bikes to get to transit a lot uh, also. And that raises another question, which is we, when we were doing the research for this meeting, we started looking into where do we put bike lockers? Um, so for example, uh, you can put them on a bus, your bike, but what do you do when you get the other end? And we're starting to look at, do we need sort of a bike locker solution so that you could do bike to train or bike to car or whatever? And we haven't thought through that through uh, in this community yet. So part of what you're supposed to be doing here tonight is you're supposed to be thinking about all these things and helping us come up with <laughs> other ideas for how we can integrate that last mile. Yes, ma'am, wait for the phone, the microphone. Thank you. I lived in Oakland. And I also lived in Washington, D.C., and I used uh, buses. But they had buses around the clock, pretty much, and they had buses every 20 minutes. And right here, I have found that buses don't run on the weekends some, in some certain uh, places, and they stop at 7 o'clock at other places. And I was wondering if there's a chance we can expand that service. Uh, Greg, do you want to take that one? Uh, well, as every, I think a number of folks have said that um, the MTD is really extraordinary uh, transit service for our community. It, there is more transit service per capita here with MTD than many places across the country. It's actually a national leader in terms of transit density and service that's provided. But it's, you know, obviously it would be better to have more. Um, the Hollister State Street Corridor has service that comes by, is it every 15 minutes or 10 minutes? Um, what, were your, what is your hand signal, Lee? Lee Moldever is a former member of the MTD board and has been involved in transportation issues for many, many years. He'd be a great resource to do this. But we actually, and in addition to the MTD, there are regional bus services that connect um, Ventura County to South Santa Barbara County. There's another service that connects the North County cities to South Santa Barbara County. So we actually do have a lot of um, rich options. There are bike lockers that are at the train stations that connect uh, and provide that ability 
opportunity for folks to have a bicycle here, get off the train, use the bike to get that last mile. There is um, electric bus shuttle service that goes from the train station to the downtown core employment centers. In addition, that service operates out in um, Goleta as well. It goes out to UCSB. So we have a lot of infrastructure. We just need to encourage more people to use it. And, and with more use, there will be more investment and there will be more success. So it's sort of a chicken and egg kind of thing. But we're at the beginning of all of these things ramping up in a large way, I think, in the future. And the key concept there was per capita. <clears throat> when you've got density of population, you can do a lot more, is Greg's point, than you can if you have thin, thinner population. But what I think he's touching on is we're sort of at a point where we can take off now. We've got some basic stuff done, and the question is what do we want to multiply and, and what do we want to increase so that the transportation element works better? Um, over here, if I Lee? can, uh, if I can add a little bit, please. To that. Um, yeah. So when, whenever MTD uh, proposes service changes, one of Coast's roles is to get bus users together to and get their comments and get them to come to the meetings of the MTD to comment on the changes. Because if nobody, if they're going to cut service and nobody complains, and they'll cut the service, um, and what's tend to be happening is increasing service on the popular routes, but cutting back service on some of the less popular routes. Partly, Uber and Lyft aren't doing transit any good. They're cutting into transit mode share in a lot of places. And uh, in fact, sometimes it would be cheaper for the city just to pay people to take Uber and Lyft than to run some of the buses <laughs> that don't get many riders if you have two or three riders on a bus. But uh, you know nobody's proposing that at the moment. <laughs> Lee, um, yeah, thank you for putting this panel together, Ronaldo. Uh, one of the things that Newt Gingrich and Robert Dole agreed upon all through the 1990s was the urgent need for comprehensive, federally funded infrastructure reform, first for maintenance of the old Eisenhower interstate highway system, which has reached its, its useful limit uh, in terms of the safety of the roads and bridges, but also for things like um, the two or three uh, railroad sidings that uh, Greg desperately was looking for nickels and dives for for a number of years while uh, his elected officials uh, subsidized the freeway widening. And yet we've gone through uh, two terms of uh, Rove Cheney Bush, who all listed infrastructure as a very high priority. We went through two terms of uh, Obama and uh, Biden, who listed infrastructure reform as a very high priority. Uh, we're halfway, more than halfway through the current administration, where Senator Mitch McConnell's wife is the transportation secretary who's tasked with making it happen. Uh, I'd like to ask Ernesto, you referenced the difference between infrastructure in Japan and infrastructure here. Uh, why don't we have the panelists talk a little bit about what it's going to take to get national and regional infrastructure funding so all the ideas that Ronaldo and tonight's panelists have talked about could conceivably be funded. Well, here's a, a transportation response. That's way out of my lane. So I'm going to defer to the supervisor on that one. Well, the, um, you're exactly right. The federal government has failed to um, adequately invest in infrastructure, and it goes to the fact that the gas tax at the federal level has not been raised in 25 years. It's the same as it was in 1994, I think, and um, that's the problem. If you don't have more money in the system, you can't make additional investments. And the, the gas tax is eroded because of inflation in that time. Its, it's value is less than half of what it was in 1994. And so it's not a surprise that there hasn't been adequate investment in infrastructure. Um, the same thing happened at the state level. For 25 years, the gas tax wasn't raised. But that changed about a year and a half ago. Voters 
um, were asked whether that should continue, and California voters said, yes, we want to have those investments. And as a result of that new revenue, the things that I was talking about are happening. That's, that's directly related to this new funding stream with these investments in bicycle infrastructure, the new train investments that we're seeing are all a product of that new um, transportation revenue. So if the same thing were to happen at the federal level and the federal government were just simply to index the gas tax to the level that it was back in 1994, um, we would have tremendous amount of new resources and be able to make the investments that we need to have 21st century um, transportation. Or reassign some of the money that we already have in other, other line items like defense. Hey, by the way, Lee, did you hear that the infrastructure meeting at the White House lasted four minutes today? Four minutes. So, so we have a problem and we have a challenge. But I, I think what Greg touched on a second ago is it was really worth underlining. We've got to be willing to vote in to the system the right support, financial support, for the transportation system we want. And I think most people in this room pretty much want something that's more 21st century than 19th century. And so the question is, how do we get there? And in, in this conversation, if we do it right tonight, is the beginning of that longer conversation. We have two comments on this side of the room, but Art Ludwig just left, and I want to highlight the fact that our next panel is going to be on housing, because he commented on the fact that housing and transportation is, are sort of two interrelated yeah. um, uh, situations. He made a comment that he paid off his house by not having a car and all the savings that he was able to enjoy over many years, and that was a house in Santa Barbara. Just that was the comment Great there. comment. And I have two additional questions. Okay, before you take the two questions, uh, so for those of you who came and want to leave by 7, please don't feel like you're being rude. 7 o'clock is here. But if you want to stick around and hear some more, please do. And will the panelists stick around for a little bit longer? For Q&A? Okay, please, next two questions. Yeah, and Art lives up on San Marcos Pass somewhere. I mean, um, Art Ludwig lives up on San Marcos Pass somewhere, so when he's committed to car-free riding, he's riding his bike up there. Um, two points, uh, pick first up on what you just said about how to get more funding maybe for transportation. Um, LA has been successful with Measure M and then Measure R, um, but that, the success was built on having a real vision that they could actually show, and certainly Measure R built on the success of Measure M. So I encourage part of this moving forward to keep that as a, um, work towards that as a potential goal to evaluate. Um, the to other, that point, by the way, yeah. so, so we're the people that we've been looking for. Meaning, if, if we're going to create a vision, why can't it start in this room? Absolutely. And then why can't we all be activated towards that vision to see what we'd like to have right. people right. at the supervisor right. level and right. people like Ernesto right. and, and Mark do for us? So I just want to encourage everybody, don't leave this to others. Right, it's like it's it's us. Okay, and then um, other than mentioning the drone delivery of pizza and presumably medicine, um, all the talk has I think been implicitly talking about transportation of people, and there are embryonic businesses out there that are talking, you know, that are delivering food and not just from one um, restaurant to one customer, but you know they're doing some pooling, I believe, of picking up multiple meals at multiple restaurants and delivering them to multiple customers. I would encourage, as part of this vision, to take a look at transportation of things, because we're only, seems like with the Amazon economy and with um, even lo uh, other retail like Walmart and other people getting into um, delivery of packages, that if every, every package is being delivered by one vehicle, um, that's gonna be a real, really inefficient. So how can government incentivize and regulate such that um, businesses know and, and commercial people are thinking about that if they're going to do that, operate in this community, that they really need to look at it as a much more system-wide. And what's the possibility of having, um, you know, every neighborhood having a um, a, a delivery hub or an inter, intermodal hub. And sure, that's not going to deal with the, the, the pizza which you want to deliver hot. But if you're talking about that once a day delivery of packages from Amazon and eBay and Walmart, that, that all those packages are coordinated. And maybe people walk to pick up 
their package rather than have to be delivered so, last month. So I'm going to take that as a comment unless any of the panel want to treat it as a question or an opportunity to comment. You know, one thing I would comment about um, the innovative companies in the transportation sector is that um, the, there is a cautionary tale about Uber and Lyft. The recent IPOs for those companies, in their SEC filings, they stated very clearly, these businesses don't make any money at the current business model that they have. They are all um, predicated on the assumption that autonomous vehicles are going to come along and drivers will be eliminated in these vehicles. So the, these companies only operate because they are continuing to get investor money to subsidize their operations. The, the drivers are not being paid enough money to actually make a sustainable living wage. There's been organizing efforts amongst the drivers, you know, complaining about that because the companies have been slowly but surely reducing the amount of compensation that they give to their drivers. There's been a lot more research into the impact Packs of Uber and Lyft in communities, particularly in the Bay Area, that have revealed that the congestion has actually increased as a result of the presence of these vehicles driving around, waiting for a ride to get. So there are um, there are things that appear to be successful and innovative and future futuristic that are actually not sustainable and may not be actually be helpful. So it's important, and, and government has not responded well to these kind of innovations. It's basically stepped out of the equation and let the private sector. Um, in, in the instances of the cab industry has kind of decimated that industry and put people out of work and um, destroyed livelihoods by allowing these companies that aren't actually making any money to come in and artificially depress prices and you know provide transportation. So um, I think we have to be careful about that. We have to think about the impacts going forward about some of these ideas that people have that, that make sense maybe on paper or for investors but not necessarily make sense yeah, for but the use But the use of Uber and Lyft is growing by leaps and bounds still. So even though it's not good for us, it's, uh, it's growing. <laughs> it's a reality. We used to have distribution centers called stores. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody knows online. I mean, I mean, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. Hi there. Thank you for hosting this forum. It's fantastic. My name's Deirdre, and I wanted to just offer a quick observation. I had the good luck to be visiting my father in Dublin, Ireland this last week. One of the perks there of getting old is that when you turn 65, you get a bus pass, and you can go anywhere in the country, and it includes a guest. So I rode the buses for the last week and never had to pay a single euro for it. It was so fun, such a great idea. I wanted to offer that. Secondly, uh, I work for an organization called Sustainable Future, and if you're thinking, what the heck can I do to combat this transportation issue, we have a top 10 list there on sustainablefuture.org of ideas that would empower people to move away from apathy and move towards personal motivation, things like fossil fuel free Friday, which is hard to say, but there's a lot of other ideas. So thank you again. You know, we could um, send that out as an email, Christy. Why don't we take the 10 points and send it out to everybody who came tonight? Okay, um, anybody else? Questions, comments? One of the things about take, I mean, there's a wonderful little um, bus that goes up and down State Street, which I've done for years. And my, I was just thinking about, well, my head exploded with the comment about infrastructure and Trump leaving the, uh, anyway, sorry. Um, so what are the problems would be parking? So if people were to come into Santa Barbara and wanted to go into the city of Santa Barbara, the big problem is where do you park so that you can take that little bus for like 50 cents that goes up and down State Street to get up and down and go and, you know, to the different stores and do whatever. And that seems to be like a huge issue about where do people park where they don't have to pay, you know, over the 90 minute, you know, whatever the, the rate is. The to, equivalent of localized park and ride. Yeah, so if there were a place <laughs> further out where people could go and drive and park and then go up and down and use the, the system would be wonderful. Yeah, it's, and in fact, we, we don't do a very good job of even connecting the park and ride we already have in terms of parking lots. Um, anyone else before we break up? Because I know people are anxious to get going for their evening. Yes, sir, over here. Thank you, John Campanella. Just on that point, I was at a American Planning Association. Yeah, John is with the planning department here in the Senate. Thank you. Uh, 
uh, American Planning Association conference in Phoenix a number of years ago, and there was a, a graduate project that showed, uh, let me call it the first mile rather than the last mile, where they did a before and after look on uh, transportation, common transportation for the city, their bus lines, that if you provided a secure space to park your bike before you got on the bus, in major stops that it might wake, that the, tra that the actual ridership increased on public transportation. So we think about the last mile, but people have to get to the bus stop in the first place. And uh, just an idea, similar to the parking lots, would be bike stations that you could se secure your bike yeah, before we, you get on the bus. John, we discovered that Greg responded to the fact that we have some bike lockers, so to speak, at the train station. And we were talking about exactly what you're talking about, which is where else do we have them so that you can go back and forth? Because that's where the last mile or the first mile kicks well, in. I'm, I'm talking about first mile, I whether know, it be a train station or, or bus. Yes. Yeah. And uh, before we close tonight, I want to thank, um, obviously, Solutions News, our, our radio show, uh, World Business Academy Coast. Thank you, one and all. Watch for your emails. we got some fun meetings coming up in the future. Have a good evening. <laughs>